My name is Victor Phillips, and my purpose here is to simply share a scary story from my time in security. I have far more than the one story to tell, but today I figured I would start with this particular one because of how it affected me the way in which I would approach my job for the next 15 years. I did actually begin my career in the Chicago Police Department fresh out of the academy, but the stress of policing some of the more violent areas of the city drove me to leave after only seven years of service. At first, I considered moving to work in some little out-of-the-way place, but I eventually realized it was the feeling of always having to carry a gun that was what had caused me to leave, or so I thought. Therefore, I decided to move over to the area of security where I was not required to carry a firearm, and almost immediately, the weight that I had been carrying on my shoulders for all those years seemed to disappear. I'm fully aware most of my fellows in law enforcement would see my career choice as a major step down, but for me, I felt the responsibility of possibly having to take someone's life weighing on me daily. Now I could still work in a position where I would be able to protect people without having to be armed while doing it. It seemed a win-win for me. Because of my prior experience, I was quickly put in charge of the night shift guarding a high-rise office building. The building was located in a quiet and once safe neighborhood in my hometown. I never liked Chicago in the first place, so leaving the force was a great opportunity to return home and be around my family and friends. The story occurred late on a Thursday night. I had been walking the female employees of the building to their cars, and that was what I was busy doing when I ran into a career-altering situation. Having just left the car of one employee... I heard the sound of a man yelling at someone across the parking lot. A quick look around and I found the source of the racket. It appeared to be a disheveled man attempting to rob a woman I knew who worked in the building. Without a second thought, I ran to help. Not until I was too close to turn around for assistance did I notice that the man was holding the poor lady at gunpoint. The attacker was at first taken aback by my presence, but the second he realized I was unarmed... He actually began laughing. He knew at that point he was in control and he took advantage of this by rushing me and clubbing me with the butt of his pistol until I apparently lost consciousness. It wasn't long before I came to but it was long enough for him to make his escape with his victim's jewelry and money. Apparently someone had witnessed the mess and called 911. After a few hours at the emergency room and a long night awake to reflect on the incident, I was horribly overwhelmed by embarrassment and regret, but that wasn't the biggest realization. It had taken such a dangerous incident to make me understand that I was responsible not only for my own safety, but also for the people I had to protect. I know it sounds stupid of me to have just come to that conclusion, but I guess I had always thought I carried a gun to protect myself from bad people. Now it seems logical that I couldn't protect others if I wasn't at first safe. What can I say? I guess I can chalk it up to my youth, but perhaps I was nothing more than a selfish kid. Regardless of the reasons or cause, I knew I had a basic responsibility to carry a sidearm when on duty, and so I have the past 15 years since and probably will until my retirement. It wasn't until I had returned to work and began discussing how much my great hometown had changed with others did I discover how bad crime had gotten. There had always been a bad neighborhood and I'd wager most cities have one of their own, but it had apparently began leaking out into the historically safe areas. This must have been what I bumped into that night. I can say with some amount of pride that in the years since then, the crime rate here has dropped drastically, and I'd like to take some responsibility in causing that. After all, that epiphany I had all those years ago showed me that I would never be of any use to my community working as a security guard. So after giving my two weeks with my present employer at the time, I joined my hometown police force and have been here doing my best to clean up my city ever since. Since an early age, my parents expended a lot of energy to make sure I believed that regardless of my gender, no one would be able to stand in the way of me achieving my goals. 
They often told me that working my hardest would be enough to get where I wanted to be and on those rare occasions when my fellow humans stood in the way of my dreams solely because of my gender, my hard work ethic would ensure my ultimate victory over their petty bigotry. Believe it or not, for the most part their corny affirmations proved to be true. I'm sure, because of the time in which we are living, getting ahead on my own merit has been the norm and I'm nothing but pleased this has been the case. Although I've heard stories and witnessed a few instances where other females have been held back just because of their sex, I myself have never been a victim of this behavior. At least, that was the case, until six months ago when I began my new career in security. My work days became one long string of belittling statements and sexual insinuations. I'm aware in an earlier time in this country that it was an accepted part of being a female in a profession dominated by men to be treated as a sort of object. However, this is the 21st century now and I was sure this type of behavior had died out with my grandparents' generation. But it appeared as if though I've walked back in time to a place where this type of treatment is encouraged. Because of this, I was recently put in a position where I would come face to face with the result of telling this type of man no, and just how badly they dislike that word. Having just left a marriage of four years, I found myself in a place I'd never been before, having to support myself. Even though I'd gone to college and received a degree in secondary education, I'd married my husband straight out of college. Him being an established doctor made it unnecessary for me to go to work immediately, we planned to have a couple of kids and I would stay at home with them until they began school. Then I would start working. While I'm sure this may sound a little old-fashioned, neither of us wanted strangers raising our children. Unfortunately, we were destined to go childless and this fact quickly destroyed our marriage. Resigned to my fate, I chose a new path and moved forward eager to start a new chapter in my life. My first assignment with the company was at a newly built mall not far from my home. As you may imagine, being a mall cop isn't exactly a great way to make money, but I did it nonetheless. Early on, I thought my biggest problem would be the shoplifters, but it soon became clear my fellow employees would be far worse. A day didn't go by that I wasn't asked out or hit on by one of the other male guards, so... Soon after getting out of an unhappy relationship, I was in no hurry to jump into the game again. Over time, they all got the hint. All but one, that is. His name was Ethan, and despite the countless number of times I shot him down, he never seemed to lose hope. Even though he was never aggressive in his advances, I feared his adoration would morph into obsession eventually, and that terrified me. After enduring months of his unwanted attention, I finally approached my boss and did not receive the reaction I expected. Hey, you should be happy someone is asking you out. You're not exactly the prettiest girl. I was so shocked that he had said this. I turned around and walked out without another word. I obviously wasn't going to get any help from him. Not before long, my greatest fear came true. A car I didn't recognize began showing up across the street from my home. Since I had befriended my neighbors on the first day I moved in, I knew the car was not theirs. Just to make sure I wasn't being paranoid, I went door to door asking my neighbors if they knew who owned the car, but none of them did. About the same time the car had shown up across the street, Ethan stopped talking to me at work. Other than asking questions pertaining to our job, he'd ceased talking to me at all. At the time, I believed it was because our boss had spoken to him, but looking back, I can't believe I didn't put the two things together. But I'm still relatively young, so I'll surely make mistakes. Once I'd noticed the car sitting outside more than five times, I went into a rage and ran over to confront the driver. Naturally, they drove away before I could, but... I did finally file a complaint with the police. I knew that there was nothing they could do, but I at least wanted to start a string of evidence so if I ever did discover the driver's identity, it would be easier to get a restraining order against them. Around the sixth month at my job, I had made the decision to begin dating again. I had run into an old friend of mine from high school that was now a cop in town. 
since things at work were beginning to get better. I had no intention of mentioning Ethan and my mystery driver was the last thing on my mind. That night was going so well. I asked my date back to my place for a movie. When we had first pulled into my driveway, the coast was clear. Before we had even made it to my front door, the mystery car quickly appeared in its usual place. However, this time the driver jumped from the car and approached us. Of course, it was Ethan, but at that time, I was surprised it was him. Right away, I could hear his curses from across the street. I thought you weren't interested in dating anyone, but it appears you just thought you were too good for me. Who's this pretty boy? By the time he'd finished his tirade, he was almost face to face with Jack, my date. This was the most embarrassing situation I could imagine. I just wanted to crawl under a rock, but then the scene took a terrifying turn. Ethan stood within mere feet of us, breathing heavily like an angry bull, and he held a gun in his right hand. He continued to stand, unmoving, staring, and slowly becoming more and more angry. Unsure of what to do or how to act, I looked to Jack for some type of guidance. He proved to be the even-headed guy he'd always been and did his best to calm Ethan down. But the second he mentioned he was a cop, this made Ethan even angrier. Oh, I see. I always knew you were a badge bunny, but apparently security guards were never good enough for you, huh? I guess seeing no other option, Jack tackled Ethan to the ground and went right for the gun. This is the point in which I was the most scared. Ethan was well over six foot and built like a linebacker and Jack was far smaller and lean, but somehow he managed to get the upper hand. After several minutes of laying a steady whipping on Ethan, Jack put the gun in his waistband and stood up. He took a quick walk to his car watching Ethan the whole time and came back with some handcuffs. Once he had him locked up, he made a call to the dispatcher to get them to send a car and bring Ethan in. During the whole time this was all going on, I didn't dare say a word, and it wasn't until Jack hung up his phone did I finally speak. I'm so sorry I got you into this mess. I'll understand if you don't want to see me again. You ain't got nothing to be sorry about. I ain't got to whip anybody's butt like that in a long time. Although it would help to know what brought all this on. While we waited on the cruiser, I explained the entire mess to him, just as I have here, and to my amazement, he still didn't run away. In the following weeks, I filed that restraining order against Ethan with help from Jack and an understanding judge. In addition to a beating he'll never forget, he was also sentenced to 18 months in the county jail. I hope, for his own good and of course mine, that when he's released he forgets about me and learns the true meaning of no when it comes from a woman. After all the stuff I'd gone through, I finally realized the security business wasn't for me and went the direction I should have in the first place. Although I may only be a substitute teacher for now, I know with my desire to excel, I'll get to where I want to be eventually. Lord knows why I didn't choose this path in the beginning, but I do know it's where I belong. With Jack at my side, I hope I may persevere in the one area I was unsuccessful. But that's another story for another time. Keep me in your hearts and I hope one day soon to be able to share it with you all. As long as I can remember, I've heard no end of stories about my granddad's years as a security guard. He started working for an armored car company but soon realized the pay didn't equal to the dangers inherent in doing the job. So, after three years with the armored car people, he moved on to the First National Bank, then located in the heart of downtown. It being a family-owned business, they did the best they could to pay a competitive wage to the employees, including my granddad. In over 20 years guarding the bank, there was just a few small problems for him to deal with and no attempted robberies, except one, and that's the story I plan to share with you all. I hope you enjoy it, but 
keep in mind it's the only story he ever only told once. As I go, I believe you may begin to see why. To the best of my memory, this incident took place around 1981. The only real reason I have for this date is because Granddad said it happened about 10 years after he began working for the bank, and I do know for certain he joined them in 1971. So, whether the date matters or not, this is when it took place. Regardless of date, the morning was an average work day. He just opened the doors a half hour before and was having a conversation with one of the regulars. Unbeknownst to him, a man had got the drop on him and gave him two quick whacks on the back of his head with his pistol. He doesn't remember what happened after that until he came to a few minutes later, but since his co-workers were able to fill in the blank spots later, I can tell you how the rest of the story played out. Before the rest of those in the bank at the time knew what was going on, the attacker fired a shot in the air and yelled to everyone to get on the floor except for the bank employees. The customers did what they were told, and the robber quickly approached the bank manager covering him with his gun the whole time. Then he calmly instructed the manager to tell the tellers to empty their cash drawers and place the money on the counter in front of them. Doing what he was told, the manager yelled out to the single cashier on duty to empty her drawer. Now, this is where the calm bank robber lost his cool. Noticing that there was only one cashier on duty, he yelled at the manager and asked him where the rest of the cashiers were. Doing his best not to anger the robber more, he reluctantly told him that it was usual for them to only have one cashier until the noon rush started. Frustrated and not knowing what to do, the robber stood for a few seconds before he let out a growl of frustration and punched the manager in the gut and face. The other's presence said the bank manager folded like a deck of cards. For a moment, the robber stood over the body of the manager and pointed his gun at him as if though he was about to shoot him, but after a couple of moments he let out another yell of frustration and turned to the cashier's window. This was around the time Grandad started to regain his wits. He said when he opened his eyes he realized he was tucked away in a small nook out of sight from anyone. When he'd been attacked, he was standing next to a cut-out area at the end of the cash windows that usually held a large plant, but since the plant had recently died, the notch was empty. Apparently when he was knocked out, his body fell into the empty space, so for a few minutes he remained laying there, just listening to what was going on. Once he realized no one could see him, he decided he'd use that advantage to ambush the thief on his way out the door. At the time he told me this, he acknowledged that it wasn't encouraged in policy to shoot a thief who had not shot at him or others in the bank first. However, he wagered that he'd have the support of his employers since he had been assaulted by the robber earlier, and even if he wouldn't be, he was mad about being pistol whipped and didn't really care anymore at the time what anyone thought about it. So, as quietly as he possibly could, he got to his knees and pulled out his pistol then all he could do was listen and wait. After beating the bank manager up and menacing him with his gun for a moment, the robber made his way to the sole open cash window to get the money that had been stacked there for him. As he approached the window, he pulled a large canvas back from a pocket of his coat and began scooping the piles of cash into it. Grandad said that although he was unable to see what was happening at that moment, he had heard enough money being handed over the years to guess what was going on. He assumed once all the money was packed up that, barring any abnormal occurrences, the robber could make a break for it, and so he did. As the bank robber's footfalls grew closer to him in the door, Grandad said a sick feeling grew in his stomach, and he wasn't going to let fear get in his way of stopping the man. Right as the robber stepped into his view, the robber turned back toward everyone in the bank and told them that if anyone got up or followed him out of the door when he left, he would come back in the bank and shoot everyone. Hearing this made my granddad even more angry than he already was. So as the robber turned to the door to take the last four steps out to freedom, granddad raised his pistol and took a shot at him. He admitted that his hand was a tad shaky and as he pulled the trigger, he still managed to hit him in the left shoulder. The second the shot hit him, Grandad said the robber turned toward him with a shocked look on his face, 
but quickly got himself together and fired one shot back. As he took the shot, the robber bounded out the door. What the robber didn't know was, the second he attacked my granddad, both the teller and the bank manager had pressed their silent alarm buttons. Despite not being able to see the police outside, they were sure once the robber made it out, the cops would be there waiting. And they were indeed. Granddad told me as he laid on his back, bleeding from his chest, not sure if he would survive. The sound of the cops gunning down the robber almost made it all worth it. Although it was hit or miss for a few days, Granddad obviously pulled through. The robber's bullet had stuck in his left lung, ended up within millimeters from his spine. The damage to his lung surprisingly turned out to be the least of his problems. It was able to be repaired that evening, but the doctors couldn't decide at first whether to remove the bullet because they feared either action could result in paralyzing him, but they eventually took the risk and removed it. He still can't find two doctors to this day that can agree whether the bullet would have moved into his spine or not, but he's just happy he eventually was able to return to work. The saddest part of this story, or maybe the funniest, depending on your view, is that the bank robber went through all that trouble to come away with only $1,500. I realize that $1,500 in 1981 was more than it is now, but I can't ever see a time it was worth someone losing their life over. I don't know, maybe I'm spoiled. The sound Grandad heard as he laid there on that floor was indeed the sound of gunshots. The medical examiner report counted 44 in total, but the chief of police made sure to show the media the bullet holes in the police cruiser that came from the robber's gun, all three of them. Like I said above, Grandad did return to the bank two months later and through the remaining years of his time there, he never had to fire his gun ever again. Although there was one time, he came close while intervening in a very heated argument between a man and his mistress, but I'll save that story for another time. You guys let me know if you're interested in hearing it. During the four years I attended college, I played a lot of poker. Over time, I became one of the best players in my school and than my state. By my senior year of school, I thought I was one of the best players in the country and no one could tell me otherwise. I was so sure I was unbeatable that when I received my financial loan money for the year, I took it all with me to a big game, often attended by many of the best players in the state, and lost almost all of it. Although I still had enough to start the year, I obviously wasn't going to make it through to graduation without finding a way to get it back. Since... I wasn't going to get the money from my parents. I had to do the one thing I'd been avoiding the last three years. Get a job. For the first few days after the game, I had no idea where to go. I was still young and had very little experience in the workforce. To my shock, I found my answer one morning in the library. The school had just posted a notice for a security guard that day and despite my initial misgivings, I saw it as a sign so I headed to the security office to see what I would need to do to apply. Luckily, the head of the campus security was in his office and invited me in to talk. He was understandably reluctant to hire a student, but I did my best to make it clear that I was desperate, and after the one-hour-plus meeting, I came away with a job. Not that I had a job, all I needed to do was find out how to be a security guard. I took the rest of the day and the next doing research, Something I look back on now is hilariously naive, but my first night of work I believe I had the job figured out. God, how I was young. My first shift was a Friday night. I was told to arrive an hour early so I could get my uniform and fill out paperwork. Once I had completed all of that, I was thrown in at the deep end. Our first call was to one of the dorms where a female student was beating up on her boyfriend. My initial assumption was that she was the one who called, but when we got there, we could see for ourselves that he was the one who needed help. All we could do was separate them and tell them to stay away from each other, but a week later I saw them on campus making out with each other, so it appeared to that he'd forgiven her. We barely had time to catch our breath before we had another call. 
All we knew at the time was that there was an argument outside of one of the frat houses just off campus. Despite the house not actually being on the campus grounds, they were part of our jurisdiction. When we showed up, it was obvious no one was happy to see us, but after a little looking around, we found who had made the call. When I came face to face with the petite and harmless looking girl, little did I know in just a matter of minutes how much she'd make me wish I'd never seen her. From what we could gather, the girl's boyfriend had caught her making out with one of the frat boys and a fight had broken out. Luckily, some bystanders separated the two guys, but they were massive rugby players and drunk to boot. The air was still heavy with testosterone and the fight breaking out again was almost guaranteed. My boss figured it would be no problem for me to talk to the girl off to one side while he dealt with the guys. A few minutes of talking to the two guys, my boss decided that since they were both drunk and had assaulted one another, they may have to go to jail. Knowing now that he was just trying to scare them and prevent another fight did me no good then because the second the girl heard this she yelled, No, at the top of her lungs, smashed a 40 ounce bottle over my head and jumped on my back. Why she attacked me I have no idea. Maybe because I was closest, but... As I stumbled around on the verge of fainting, you do know how hard those bottles are, right? Swatting at her and trying not to hurt her, but still attempting to get her off of my back, the girl's boyfriend broke free and ran up and punched me. Of course, the combination of the bottle and the punch caused me to drop. Naturally, when I fell, the girl on my back fell to the ground too. Seeing this, for some reason the other guy broke free from the couple holding him and attacked the girl's boyfriend. As I slipped into unconsciousness, a mass of chaos grew around me. The next thing I can remember, a paramedic stood over me asking me questions while I cleaned the blood from my head. I was loaded on a stretcher and as I tried my best to take in the result of the melee, I saw each of the guys sitting in the back of the police cars and a cop talking to my boss who was sporting a busted lip. I was unsure of what happened to the girl at the time, but I was sure of one thing. I was quitting that job immediately. I spent that night in the hospital and was released around 9 the next morning. Despite having a splitting headache, I went straight to the security office and told my boss I was quitting. He didn't bother to try to talk me out of it. He probably knew I wasn't right for the job and I did beg him for the job, so I guess he decided to give me a chance. It turned out the girl had been arrested first and had been taken away before I was conscious. He mentioned that the cops wanted to know if I wanted to press charges against her, but I took the high road and declined. Honestly, I just wanted to get the whole mess out of my mind as quickly as possible. Since I'd quit, I was obviously back to square one, but I decided to take the path I should have in the first place and hit the bricks. Finally, after a week of going business to business asking for applications, I got hired on Add a Dollar Tree. As long as I didn't conflict with classes, I took every shift I could, even taking ones from anyone who had emergencies pop up. Doing this, along with the occasional card game, I managed to make it to graduation by the skin of my teeth. If you're looking for a moral to this story, there really isn't one. If you want to take something away from my experience, I would say don't get involved in domestic arguments and if you ever think of becoming a security guard, be sure you can handle it. Despite what most Americans think, it can be a hard job, and I respect everyone who does it. I'd have to be majorly out of touch not to be aware of society's overall attitude towards security guards. Names like Renacop are pervasive in our country. Not to mention movies like Paul Blart do our profession no good, but I can promise you, thousands every day, men and women both risk their lives to protect people and products from those who put their safety and security in danger. I'm here to share one such story with you all today. I began my career in security much like the majority of us do, with a private company. Depending on the day, I may spend my time patrolling a strip mall or protecting a high-end jewelry store. 
This was my gig for 12 years until I was headhunted away by a 4 and 5 star hotel chain to run their security in one of their Florida locations. The chance to no longer have to pound the pavement was too good to pass up and I accepted the job right away. I initially had four guys working under me but I added one more guy within a month of getting there. For the most part, the hotel was a quiet place, so for me and my guards it was a low stress environment. Things stayed relatively easy going for the first year. Don't get me wrong, it was by no means a utopia, because our location and reputation we tend to attract celebrities of all forms of entertainment looking to take a break from the constant peeping of the media. Occasionally we are faced with a star who mistakes our respect of his privacy as an excuse to take things too far. It was one particular entertainer's disgusting behavior that motivated me to share this tale with everyone here. When I took the job as senior pencil pusher, I was well aware I would be sacrificing some of the more exciting aspects of the job for more money. So, that morning we got the call for backup from one of my guys. I jumped on it. Apparently, he answered a noise complaint from another guest, and even after five straight minutes of knocking on the door, the only answer he received was the sounds of furniture and glass breaking. So, not sure what he was about to walk into, he called for backup. Once I arrived, we carefully entered, still announcing our presence the entire time. The room was now completely silent. As I peeked around the corner, I noticed the guest laying still on the bed surrounded by broken furniture. Figured he had worn himself out. I told my guy we should check on him to make sure he didn't need the paramedics. As we calmly and confidently approached the bed, he leapt up and pounced upon my employee. While he hung around his neck like a monkey, he was screaming something about the CIA. My guards stumbled and dropped to the ground, continuing to fight off his attacker. Almost as soon as he pounced on my guy, I was standing behind the guest, punching him in the kidneys, trying to get him off of my employee's back. What I wasn't aware of at first, because of where I was standing, was that he had been stabbing my guy with a steak knife, but once he fell to the ground, I could see his wounds. The guest was trying to get back to his feet while still ranting, but now had turned his crazy eyes onto me and raised his knife. As his arm came down, I lifted mine and blocked his strike, but nonetheless got slashed through the forearm. At this point, I was fed up with this guy, so I grabbed his knife hand and started punching him as hard as I could until he blacked out. He finally dropped after the 10th or 11th strike. He had to have been on something strong because he should have been knocked out way before that. I jumped up and grabbed a napkin from a room service tray and wrapped it around my arm to slow the blood. Once I'd kicked the guest off of my guy, I could check his wounds far better. Even though I was afraid he had been poked full of holes, he only had two really bad wounds on his upper chest. I removed my shirt and used it to apply pressure until the paramedics arrived. They patched him up temporarily and rushed him off to the ER. The cops cuffed the guest and... The minute he came to, he went back to ranting and putting up a fight with the police for quite a while, but he left the hotel shackled from his ankles to his wrists with a few more injuries. It wasn't until the whole mess cooled down did I remember I had a cut on my arm. I hoped I could get away with throwing a band-aid on it and go about my work, but once I had a good look at it, I knew it was a bit more serious. I was headed to the hospital anyway to check on my guy, so I stopped off and had them stitch it up once I discovered his condition. To his family's joy and mine, the stab wounds were not life-threatening. Out of the six punctures, only the two were deep enough to cause any long-term damage if they had hit something vital, but since one was in his shoulder and the other just below it, in the upper chest well away from his heart, other than a few weeks of pain, he would be fine. After two weeks of paid vacation, he returned to work almost as fit as before. Because of his place in society and his money, he had to know he was going to get off with a slap on his wrist. His people managed to get the incident hushed up, but I made sure that he was banned from staying at any of our hotels across the country. My guard, Alan, did walk away with a couple hundred thousand after the news he had contacted a lawyer reached the guest. He's happy his son's college funds are taken care of for now, but I doubt he'd tell you it was worth it. 
The incident did serve as a reminder that I'm not as strong or as tough as I used to be, so now I leave it to my guards to back each other up. I'd hate to be the reason one of my guys got hurt or killed because I didn't know when it was time to pass the torch on to someone younger and fitter. I understand now my number one priority is to ensure I have the best guys available to keep the guests of the hotel and my other employees safe from maniacs like the one I just told you about. If that has become my place in life, I see it as the noblest one to hold and I am more than honored to be the man chosen to do it. Until recently, my life was what I considered wonderful. However, in the last year, my marriage of 10 years ended, and I have been unable to see my daughter since she left with my ex-wife when she moved to be closer to her parents. Considering my family life has just collapsed, I have begun focusing more on work. I've been working for a large private security company since 2005, and it's proved to be an enjoyable experience. Although most of my time with the company I've worked the graveyard shift, I've never seen or heard anything out of the ordinary occurring. Things were appearing to go ahead as normal, until a few nights ago when I saw something so horrifying I considered quitting my job right then and there. The following story is my best possible telling of what I experienced. I promise you, words cannot begin to describe how scary this all was. The two nights in question were strangely dark, black in an almost unworldly way. My employer had contracted me to work nights watching over a large pre-owned car lot that had recently been plagued with a rash of thefts. I was posted in a small building, maybe 8 by 10 in size. My theory is it once served as one of those photomat buildings where they used to process photographs until they died out in the mid-80s. The building has enough room for a small desk to hold a laptop and a radio charging unit. At the desk sets a rolling office chair and the whole setup stands in front of a sliding drive through window. There's just enough space left for the door to open into it and no more. Despite it being rather cramped, I've been able to make it work. Most of my shift I sit at the table and browse through the internet. About every hour or so I step out to do my rounds of the lot. My jaunts around the property give me a chance to stretch my legs and enjoy the cool night air. An occasional run-in with some critter like an armadillo is the extent of my visitors, and this is the way I've always liked it. This property, in spite of its prior activities, had been an especially quiet one. I had been optimistic I'd get through the contract without any trouble from those who had caused me to be here in the first place. But after my experience of a few nights ago, I would much prefer to have to deal with thieves rather than him. A couple of nights ago, I believe it was a Monday, i have been kicking back and watching an episode of an old podcast and drinking my fifth cup of coffee. The air in the shed was starting to get a bit stale, so I stood up to open the sliding window. Sitting down, I went back to watching the podcast. I'd had my laptop turned up about halfway so I'd still be able to hear any noises in the area. As the show wrapped up, I stood up again to get some circulation back into my legs. I was shaking out my legs when I heard a light scuffing noise, like a dress shoe scraping across asphalt. Quickly, I looked out the window and made eye contact with a man. This wasn't a regular man, however. He stood around the same height as me and was wearing a dark blue windbreaker zipped all the way up. I couldn't see his pants at the time, but those don't matter. He just looked wrong. The only way I can describe it. The longer I looked at him, the more uncomfortable I grew. His face was a whitish, almost opaque color, but it was his grin. God, that grin. His smile stretched across his face to an unholy extent. It was like he had grabbed at his mouth and pulled it almost to his earlobes. Despite my overwhelming desire to scream, I could not move. He stood frozen, only continuing to stare into my eyes. Although I was sure his grin could not grow any larger, 
He drew it up into a freakish half-moon shape and said just this, Hello there. The words slid slowly from his mouth as he said it. His voice was deep and full of a dark sort of glee. As soon as the words ended, his thin lips snapped back into the maniacal grin he had when I first noticed him, and the terror had grown so strong, I began pawing at my mouth in an attempt to stifle the sobs that were creeping into my throat. Still unable to move and locked eye to eye with him, a glint of light flashed in his icy blue eyes. For some reason, this was the last straw for me, and the muffled sobs I had been trying so hard to stifle broke free and exploded into a full-blown wailing. Somehow, I was able to close my eyes, but the wailing continued for what seemed like hours, but surely was just minutes. My hands were now soaked with my tears and I could feel my knees beginning to buckle. On the edge of hyperventilation, I dared to open my eyes and was relieved to see he was gone. Just like that, I dropped to the floor and continued to sob, but now in relief rather than terror. I was awakened by a loud banging. It took a moment to get my wits about me before I realized where I was at. I jumped up and opened the door of the shed. The morning sun burned my eyes as I peered out at my boss. You've been asleep this whole time? I tried to get a hold of you on the phone multiple times, but got nothing. One of the shop guys called me this morning and said your car was still in the parking lot when he showed up at 7.30. Are you okay? Wiping the sleep from my eyes, I explained that the night shift must have caught up with me and I fell asleep so hard I couldn't be roused. Although at first I expected him to be mad, he appeared to have just been concerned since I was usually off work and checking in with him by 6am or soon after. We'll get home and get some sleep. We have to sit on this place for at least the rest of the week and I don't have anybody to take your place. When this contract wraps up, just take a couple of weeks of vacation. You're too close to retirement to burn out now. I hadn't realized until he mentioned it that I hadn't taken any time off for over a year so I agreed and headed for home. Not until the drive home did I remember what had happened the night before. Despite it seeming so real, there was no way that it was any more than an awful nightmare. I've had them a few times, never quite as vivid as that, but my logically bent mind wouldn't let me believe that he was real. Even after all the sleep I'd had that night, I was still abnormally tired and managed to sleep the whole of the day and into the evening, waking up with barely enough time to get to work. However, after a few cups of coffee, I was back to normal and on high alert. That night shift was quiet as usual, until around 1.15 when I noticed a dark, late-model truck pass the shed a couple of times. Suspicious, I stepped out of the shed and walked a few feet toward the road. No more than a minute later, the same truck appeared again and approached the lot, this time driving very slowly. As it got near, the truck came to a complete stop in front of me. It sat there mere seconds before speeding off. After that, I never saw them again. If I was willing to bet, the people in that truck were the reason I'd been hired to do this job. Hopefully, knowing security is watching the lot at night now will give them second thoughts about coming back in the future. I stood there waiting for them to come back for around 10 minutes before I gave up and went back into the shack. A couple of hours went by before I decided I should take a walk around the lot and make sure my friends in the truck hadn't come back. I picked up my phone and stuck the keys in my pocket as I opened the door. When I looked up, I came eye to eye with the smiling man. Close up, his inhuman grin was even more horrible and unnatural. Once again, I was frozen in fear. As we stood staring at each other, the terror inside me grew and my obvious discomfort made his grin spread wider and wider. Then, just as before, the massive hole opened and let out a deep, breathy voice. Hello, my friend. His words had the laughing timber of a madman, and every second I was in his presence, my psyche continued to crumble. 
The unnatural blue glint in his eyes conveyed the boundless joy he felt as I mentally collapsed in front of him. In order to make one final attempt at unraveling me completely, he slowly extended his right arm toward me, moving ever so slowly. My breathing grew quicker. The thought of this freak touching me was driving me mad. At this point, I was already a sobbing mess, but right before his slender claw touched me, a guttural and primal scream burst from my throat, and I fell back into the shed. Instinctively, I slammed the door closed and locked the deadbolt. I quickly crawled under the desk and covered my head. Although I couldn't see him, I could hear him just above me staring through the sliding window. At some point in the night, I could hear the scuffing sound of his shoes as he walked away. Just like the night prior, I stayed curled up into a ball, this time under the table quietly sobbing until dawn. As the first rays of sun peered into the little shed, I timidly crawled from under the table and peeked out of the window to ensure the ghoul was truly gone. Once I was sure, I grabbed my things and ran to my car. I drove directly to our office and demanded the boss take me off the job. He said nothing at first, just staring for a moment. I can imagine my appearance was shocking. I spent the night huddled under a table bawling like a frightened child, but essentially that's what I'd been. Somehow, that horribly distorted man had an unworldly power over me, a power I could neither explain nor understand. Waiting for my boss to answer, I stood before him impatiently. Please, sit down and relax. His words were blunt and commanding, but I continued standing, unwilling to move, but when he pointed to a chair next to me, I relented and sat. Once I had sat, his expression changed to one of concern and he asked me what was wrong with me. Confident that he would never understand the terror of the situation, I said nothing other than there were some weird things happening around the car lot and it was freaking me out. I did, however, make it out to sound as if though I was possibly just worn out like he had suggested the morning prior. Once again, he sat silent for a minute and stared at me with a look of indecision. Okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to take a few weeks off. I don't want you to do anything other than sleep and lay out in the sun. When the two weeks are over, you're going to come back, work days for a while. And when I say a while, I mean a long while. You've been working nights for far too long. Humans need sun and sleep to function, especially at your age. I'll say yes, sir, and I'll stick you on a desk until you retire. Initially, I felt a pang of disgust at how he summed it all up to something so stupid, but I'd gotten what I wanted. Although I hated working days, it reduced my chances of ever having to come face to face with that man again, so I agreed and drove home. So it's Thursday afternoon, and we're back to the present time. Now that my story has been told, I want to make one thing very clear before moving ahead. Now, and never have I believed the smiling man to be some kind of supernatural entity. Those type of things belong in the world of fantasy and science fiction, believe me. No, that man is most certainly a living human being that eats and breathes just like the rest of us, and that's what makes his existence all the more horrifying. Someone like him, whether they are merely disfigured and mad or something far worse we have yet to comprehend, cannot be disregarded like any sensible member of society can disregard a ghost or brain-eating zombie. We are forced by matter of chance to suffer the horror of his ungodly image and what, if any, power he has to push your sanity to the breaking point. As far as my life moving forward... I hope to soon see the beautiful face of my daughter and be able to, no matter how briefly, take my mind away from the terrible visage that haunts me day and night. I also pray to God that upon returning to work, I will never be subjugated to such a terrible experience again. I have now had my say, but I want to leave you with one simple piece of advice. If you are ever out at night and come upon a tall, and thin man with pasty pale skin and a freakishly large grin. 
don't look him in the eyes, and run away as fast as possible. I can assure you, he's someone you will never want to meet. Despite my reservations, I think it's important for me to share this story with all of you, who I've spent so much of my free time in the past three years with. Many of those around here may be aware that I have recently become a security guard at our local high school. What you may not know is that we recently had an incident there, and since then I have begun to rethink my decision about my future. Thus, this is why I'm posting the actual story of what occurred, and will be asking everyone their opinion of what I should do going forward. Now that we're done with formalities, I'll let you all in on what happened. Those of you who don't know the background of what led me to taking this job, I'll take a brief moment to catch you all up before I get to my account of the incident. I'm a recent graduate of our nearby junior college, and although I did leave with a bachelor's degree, my town's police department is not taking any applicants at present. Since I have no desire to move elsewhere, I figured I should get a job doing something very similar to law enforcement at least until I can get on with my local PD. Here's where my buddy Rob stepped up and got me a job doing security at our old high school. Since he's the vice principal there, he used his small amount of influence with the school district and got me hired. The chance to get paid to relive my old school memories made it much more than just some run-of-the-mill rent-a-cop job for me. If anything, it could provide me with a little experience dealing with and solving problems, a thing I have been told often is the key to becoming a great beat cop. Well then, now that everybody's caught up, I'll get to the reason I'm here and why it's causing me some problems. Most of my morning is spent at one of the metal detectors posted at each of the main entrances of the building. For the most part, this particular task is uneventful. We do have the occasional kid attempt to sneak in a pocket knife, but this usually ends up being a mistake and we confiscate it. The child may get detention, but more often than not, they are let off with a warning after a rage-laden call from their parents. Since I was an absent-minded boy at the time, this seems fair. I see no need to ruin a kid's future because of a small mistake. Anyhow, my thoughts on punishment aside, the rest of my shift may be taken up with patrolling the parking lot or escorting some student to the office. Considering I'm the rookie of the team, I'm often given the less glamorous tasks. One of these is checking the area out behind the old machine shop for smokers. Since I was a member of this crowd during my time at the school, I didn't really enjoy busting the new generation, but I do it anyway. I was returning from this said task with a couple of students in tow when I ran head first into the biggest test of my young life. At the same time I was looking for kids sneaking a smoke, one of the old guards, Cliff, who just happened to be a retired police officer, was searching the school for a freshman who had disappeared about an hour earlier from his math class. I was fairly positive that one of my smokers was the kid he was looking for. Not far from the office, the roar of gunshots came from the opposite end of the hall. Pointing at the office, not far from where we were standing, I hurriedly yelled at the boys to go ahead and I ran as fast as I could towards the shots. I'm well aware that this was a stupid thing to do, especially being unarmed, but this is part of my job. Cliff was the only one of us with a gun and I knew he had just been in that area. Barely halfway down the hall, I saw Cliff coming out of a janitor's closet and he continued walking toward me, but he didn't appear to see me. As I grew closer, I noticed a look of shock frozen on his face. I approached him and asked if he had heard the shots, but he didn't answer. He continued walking away, only pointing at the closet. I yelled at him to get his attention, but this proved to be useless so I swallowed the lump in my throat and slowly opened the closet door. As happens in such times, the door creaked loudly as it opened. Once it was about one-fourth of the way open, I peeked around the edge of the frame and saw the body of a boy laying on the floor. This shocked me at first, but I quickly pulled myself together and craned my head further into the room. This is when I noticed a revolver laying in the pool of blood slowly growing about his body. 
I summoned up my courage and entered the closet to get a better look. Looking down upon the boy's body, I realized that this was the kid that had gone missing from his class earlier. Not wanting to mess up any evidence, I reached out over him, the whole time supporting myself on the wall and checking his pulse. There wasn't one. So making one more quick scan around the closet, I walked gingerly out the door. On my way out, I did notice a blue backpack wide open in the sink. I can only assume this was where he had kept the gun the whole morning and this closet was the place he had been hiding in. God knows what he was planning on doing once he left that closet. Despite him only being a 14-year-old kid, I'm glad Cliff stopped him before he had the chance to start it. When I closed the door behind me, I made a call on my radio to the front office and told them to call the police. By this time, the other guard had arrived on the scene, so I asked him to watch the door until the police arrived. Cliff was still walking like a zombie down the hall, heading who knows where, so I jogged up to him and put my arms around him in an attempt to comfort him. The shock was still fixed on his face and the only words he spoke to me were, he wouldn't drop it. I, I don't know. I, he was just a boy. I steered him towards the office and sat next to him on some chairs just inside the door. Once the police had spoken to him, one of the officers drove Cliff home and, from the way it looks, he won't be coming back to work. Shooting the kid, regardless of the circumstances, has messed him up. Everyone is almost positive that no charges will be filed against him. That little punk would have killed unknown amounts of people if Cliff hadn't stepped in and... I haven't met a single person who doesn't support what he did. Almost at once, the search for how the kid got the gun into the school began. After a week of investigating, it was decided that he had probably entered through the service entrance coming from the machine shop, the very same door I had used later that morning to catch the kid smoking. We discovered that there was a screw sticking in the door jamb that prevented the door from locking automatically. Somehow this student had discovered this flaw in the lock and used this as a path to sneak in the gun. No other door lacked a metal detector, so this had to be it. In the weeks since this incident, I had had a lot of time to think about what went down that day, and this has created several questions and concerns in my mind. Ever since I was five, I've wanted to be a cop. It's all I ever dreamed of, but now I don't know if I've got what it takes. Seeing that dead kid on the floor scared the life out of me and seeing Cliff's reaction, a 25-year veteran, shooting him, made me even more terrified. After loads of thinking, I don't think I could kill another person, especially a kid or anyone for that matter. Considering the ever-increasing instances of shootings, there is a much higher possibility that I may have to pull the trigger on a young person in the future if I do choose to pursue this dream. I guess it's painfully obvious that I'm in need of some guidance here. I'm willing to listen to every suggestion and idea. Maybe I was never cut out to be a cop or I'm simply a coward. Let me know what each of you think or what you would do if you were in my position. Any little thought or idea may help. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, our Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merchandise on Spreadshirt.com. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.